Well, howdy, boys and girls. Uh, I'm Al, the dog trainer, here with my good friend, uh, Mandy Apes. Uh, welcome to Ask Al, episode number 39. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, the format tonight is uh, you guys have asked a ton of questions in a ton of varieties uh, in a ton of ways this week. And now what I'm going to do is we're going to go through and answer each one of them one by one. Um, I appreciate each and every one of you guys. If you're a client, if you're a fan, uh, if you're just watching this and stumbling upon, really appreciate you coming here. Um, like I said, my name is Al the Dog Trainer. I've been training dogs oh, for, well, I've been training dogs professionally for uh, nine years now, coming pretty close to 10, really excited about that. But I've been involved in some form of drug training for the last 14 years. But we, I help a lot of families uh, raise happy and reliable dogs. We also coach people that compete with their dogs in different dog sports. So uh, I just have a huge passion for this. And uh, yeah, so we've got lots of questions tonight. If you have questions that you want me to answer uh, during the show, feel free to drop those down in the comment section below. And if you like the show, please smash that thumbs up. And if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button and be sure to tap the notification bell. That way you know each and every time that we're going to have one of these live shows. So anyway, without any further ado, we're going to get into the questions and get rolling. All right, guys. So, uh, all right, Mandy. So what's question number one? How do you stop play biting? Well, play biting is a common problem that you're going to see in pets generally from the time that they're born to really you're going to see it kind of begin to subside at about six and a half months. Um, play biting is very, very normal, but as I've been witness to, as if I've experienced, uh, puppies bite the living heck out of people and man, puppy bites, they hurt. Uh, they're meant to hurt because the puppies are using their teeth to defend themselves. But what they're also doing is they're practicing for what a puppy actually is. They're, they're a wolf and they want to play and they want to do things. And, uh, and putting their mouth on your furniture, on your skin, on your kids, on your face, on anything they can get their little jaws on, that's going to happen in the first six months of your life. So, you know, how do you stop it from happening? Well, it's kind of inevitable because a dog, a puppy is going to bite you during that time. But I do have some advice about what you can do to actually get a dog to do it correctly. Well, what do I mean by correctly? Well, since they're going to bite, and this is a very useful skill for the dog, you want to teach the dog what to actually do with their mouth. So the first thing that I recommend to anybody is to get your dog several toys. Now, when you get your dog your toys, I don't want you just to put them randomly throughout the house and hope that your dog is going to play with them. Your dog genetically wants to play a game together with another dog or even better with you. So go buy some different toys. We rec I really love the ball on the string. I really love any of these tug toys like a rope on it, uh, like the, the rope toy. I like the leather rag. I like tugs, but something soft enough and something small enough that it can fit inside of your puppy's mouth. So the first way that you're going to actually reduce the amount of puppy nipping, okay, is first to actually play a game. You want to play tug or you want to play fetch with your puppy. And as you're playing this game and if you use, you know, your human strengths and you're playing with them, you're going to wear them out and the need to play will go away for a little while. But you're also going to have another huge benefit. The other big benefit is you're going to begin to establish yourself as somebody that's worth having fun with. So I really want you to first get yourself a toy, a tug toy, a ball on a string, something to fetch with, and begin to play a game with your dog. Now, let me give you some suggestions about the way you should play. Okay, so first, you need to have a leash on your dog while you're playing because if there is an errant bite on your body or you know on your skin then you need to use the leash to be able to remove the dog from doing that or prevent the dog from doing that make sure that the dog is actively going after the toy and not actively going after your hands okay so the next tip okay after you've begun to play with your puppy the next tip is is if you have an extremely mouthy puppy make sure that you're only petting them when you have food in your hand. Now that can be a little tough, but if you're starting your dog, it's a good time, it's a good time to start training. Put some food in your hand, get them to do something that you like, and then while you're feeding them out of one hand, use your opposite hand to gently and calmly stroke them across their back. And this is probably my top tip 
for little kids. Little kids tend to get bit by dogs a whole bunch, especially puppies. So if you can bring the, if you can teach your kids to bring the food to the puppy's mouth, or you bring the food to the puppy's mouth while they gently and calmly stroke the dog's back, that is a really great way to go about doing that. Mandy, do you have any tips for like you, you like so is Rosie the is she a, she a puppy like how yeah, old is she? Like so how much how much is she biting right now? Uh, she's pretty mouthy. Yeah, okay. she and she really wants to bite my hands. Yeah, and um, so what what have you done? She actually oh yeah she, she, she tried to bite her toy and she missed and got my arm pretty good but oh wow yeah, yeah. that didn't feel too hot no, no. It stung. but um I just give her her toy and just replace and she will leave me alone for. 35 seconds, <laughs> 30, yeah, so like a puppy is pretty, uh, a puppy's really gonna come after you quite a mm -hmm. bit, okay? One of the things I'm working with a puppy right now and what I'm noticing is that, that like we played with the puppy, uh, just to, you know, we played with the puppy for about 20 minutes or so, we came back in and the puppy was still biting. And so you know what we did? We put the puppy in a playpen. You don't necessarily have to put them in a crate. Luckily, this family is, you know, play penning their dog. They're also crating their dog, and they're also training with, with their puppy. But I think that if you play a game, you do your best, and then, hey, life happens, and you, mm -hmm. need, to, you need to get back to work or get back mm -hmm. to other things, then a play pen is a really great way to manage your dog. One of the things that I notice in a lot of homes that are having a lot of biting issues with dogs is that they're giving free rein to the dog inside the home and it's going to be a reign of terror for six months if you don't start actually getting your dog you know managed and yeah that leash can help but man that playpen is a is a big yeah. lifesaver yeah so those are some tips that you can use play with your puppy well uh, make sure that you have a leash on make sure you have a leash on them um, and then also put them up whenever they're not uh, whenever you're not actually engaged with them is a good way to go Okay, the next question is, um, why, why is my dog so timid and what can be done? You know, dogs are timid for different reasons. And I feel that a lot of people say that dogs are timid, that dogs are timid because something must have happened to them, you know, before I got them. And that's really the case in a lot of rescues. And I'm not going to disagree with that per se, that like, hey, that doesn't happen because humans, unfortunately, we... You know, unfortunately, sometimes abuse and neglect dogs. Um, but I think to the degree that I see that that particular comment comes up is that, you know, it's probably not the case. I think that genetics has a lot to do with it. You know, dogs, dogs can actually benefit from being a degree, you know, a certain degree timid around humans because that's how they're going to get along with us. Because if they were all just biting us all the time, um, yeah. We wouldn't necessarily be there. They wouldn't necessarily be man's best friend. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't like how many of those bites could you take before you said, "Hey, you know, I don't know about you." Yeah. Yeah. After so, about six, yeah, after six months old and they're yeah. an adult, yeah. No. Yeah. So you can't keep getting you can't keep getting bit, right? You know, because that's just it's just not right. So, so a dog, you know, a dog can be timid, and there's a variety of reasons why your dog might be timid. It might be genetic. Uh, it might be environmental, but here's the good news. The good news is, is you can do something about it. Um, and one of the things that doesn't work for building your, uh, for getting your dog to be less timid is petting them when they're afraid. It's actually, you know, that's really kind of counterintuitive what you should do. So what you shouldn't do is your dog is nervous and afraid and you should go over to your puppy, pick them up and start petting them and telling them that the world is going to be okay. Well, the world is going to be okay, but, okay, don't pet your puppy when they're afraid. What I really recommend doing is starting to teach your dog some of these really basic skills, you know, how to stay, how to walk with you, how to come to you, because what you're going to find in your dog's life is as your dog is navigating our human world, that those three skills are going to happen to the degree, like to a degree much higher than anything else that the dog is ever going to do. So... Begin to teach your dog some useful skills. I highly recommend the play stay. I'll always recommend it. Um, it's just an incredible skill for a dog to have uh, because then like if you teach the dog how to stay in your living room, if you teach the dog how to stay in your kitchen, then you can teach the dog how to stay in a hotel um, at the airport mm -hmm. or in your RV, on your boat, and you know anywhere that you can imagine that you would take your pet with you, 
you're going to use that scale and you're going to generalize it to show your dog that. So number number one is teach your dog, you know, how to you know, teach your dog how to stay somewhere. But the other thing, teach yourself to not pet your insecure dog. Now, there is a difference between holding an insecure dog, which can be really beneficial, and petting them. And it seems pretty subtle, but if you just pick up your puppy and you hold them in your clutches, in your hand, and you put your hand over their shoulder and do nothing else, that will have a calming effect on the dog. But if they're, if, you know, if you can feel their muscles shaking underneath your hand and then you begin to stroke their head and you talk to them at the same time, that's going to work against you and you're going to build more insecurity because the dog doesn't know how to manage the things that are going on. So there's a lot that can be done, but I would definitely stay with place training and, uh, and whatever, regardless of the reason that your dog is timid, just know that something can be done and your dog can be helped. Okay, next question is, what's a good way to potty train my dog? Well, the worst piece of advice that I could give you is to let your dog loose in the home and try to catch them in the act of using the restroom before you take them out. So you don't want to do that. If your puppy is running around your home and there's a bowl of, uh, bowl of food and a bowl of water down on the ground and the puppy is allowed to eat out of that at any time, that's not a way to potty train a dog. You know, one of the things that I've noticed is that if you have multiple dogs and maybe let's say that you're free feeding one of your dogs and you have a water bowl for them out, then your puppy is going to come if they're unmanaged and they're going to get into that. And it's going to be really difficult for you to actually potty train your dog if they've got free access to an adult dog's food, in particular, an adult dog that's kind of picking and grazing at their food. I'm very blessed. This wall right here, right behind uh, where this painting is, that's actually where I have my water bowls. And my water bowls actually, for the most part, even for my adult dogs, stay behind a locked door. Now, I don't have it locked to keep my dogs out of the water bowl. I keep it locked because it's hot outside and that room serves as a little bit of insulation for my home to keep my electricity bill low. But what I recommend is just controlling the water. And your veterinarian is going to tell you to have water out throughout the day. And yes, that is important, okay? But I'm also telling you that you need to manage and watch your dog. So you have to find a happy medium between your dog having access to fresh water so they can grow and they can stay healthy and stay hydrated. But also you need to have the ability to be able to manage the, manage the dog when they eat and when they feed. So again, and I've said this uh, time before if you guys have, for you guys that are watching this, that it's a great idea to hand feed your dog. And it's a great idea that when you hand feed them, that's when you give them access to water. And those are some really, that's really going to give you some insight to when is my dog going to actually need to go and use the restroom. Okay. Yeah, I think that's good. We've got plenty of other videos on the channel. If you're really needing some help with potty training, don't mm -hmm. hesitate. Don't hesitate to go into, I think it's Al's dog training tips on the playlist. And man, I think we have over a hundred videos. If, if not, we're going to be there within the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I think it is. You know, we've got a, a whole bunch of videos on there that can really help you uh, to be able to understand how to potty train your dog. And heck, uh, I'm always happy to answer any questions. If you want to reach out on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, here on YouTube, ask a question. Um, I'm always very happy to answer those. So, okay. Okay. Next is how long does it take to teach a dog to walk off leash? Well, every dog is different. So with Jasmine, and Jasmine, I don't know if y'all can see this, but Jasmine, uh, here, I guess I should open up the... Uh, oh, sorry. No, it's okay. I was using your screen to kind of, <laughs> to, to, to kind of cheat a little bit. Yeah, okay. So you guys, you guys can see it. Um, so Jasmine, which is, uh, which is the white and tan dog that you see there in the middle, uh, I got Jasmine to walk off leash after about four years worth of effort, but that was the first dog that was the first dog that I ever tried to train uh, off leash. It was my first dog as an adult, so it, it took me a lot longer. I would say with Fritz, it took me, it took me about a year and a half to two years to do off leash stuff. And with Gabby, uh, I could have Gabby off-leash in certain circumstances at about a year, 
And like now I feel really good about having her off leash in a ton of circumstances. Now I'll tell you guys this, if you want to call it paranoia or just being safe, um, I don't like my dogs to be off leash in public places um, because you know, it just takes one accident that something happens that you didn't expect um, and your dog makes a mistake and there's no line there. Now, I'd be happy to go into a place like Lowe's or any of these stores and take my dog off leash and work with my dog in there. I think that that's fine. But, you know, walking by a busy street with no leash, um, I just don't know that I can put the dog in jeopardy that, like, that way. I'm positive that Gabby could walk off leash for several miles with no problem. Um, but I just don't, I don't take the risk. So if you're looking really to have your dog off leash, just make sure that you're keeping them, uh, make sure that you're keeping them safe. Uh, this is why I'm a, a big advocate for the remote collar because you can give your dog, uh, you can give your dog a lot of freedom um, and having them off leash, but you can still have a remote collar there to kind of help them if they get themselves into trouble. If you need to get some attention or if you need to remind them about where the boundaries are uh, of things that they don't maybe have forgotten. And I think a remote collar is a really great tool to help them, whether it's the vibrate or any of the, the myriad of levels of stimulation that you can use from a gentle touch to something a little bit firmer to stop an emergency. Uh, I think a remote collar is a great way to do that. Uh, however, to answer the question, I think that if you're new to dog training, um, but you're diligently working, you can get a dog to be off leash within a couple of years uh, pretty consistently. But that doesn't mean that you couldn't do it much sooner. But I think that patience always wins whenever you train a dog. Don't try to train the most expedient thing. Try to get the relationship to where you want it. And who cares really? Like, if, if you know, who cares if the dog can really walk off leash? It's really more about having a fantastic relationship with your dog rather than your dog being off of equipment. Mm -hmm. Someone wants to know how they can get their dog to bark at the door. You know, that's a really good question. You know, some dogs actually have a problem with not being, not being able to bark. And any time that I try to answer a question like this, I try to put myself, you know, in the dog's head. I try to put myself into like what's going on in your mind and what's going on in your home. So as I think about those things, then I come back to a piece of knowledge that I have. And here's the piece of knowledge. Uh, scarcity is the mother of desire. So I think about that. Anytime that I want to create something, I think about like, okay, I got to create something out of nothing. And so I need to make, I need to sacrifice something. I need to make something scarce. So that way there's a desire for that particular thing. So the way that I would, if you have a dog that's not barking at the door at all, then that means that they maybe have a lot of freedom and they're constantly satisfied. Okay. Now, this may be a dog that just really chill, calm temperament. Well, you got to get them excited about something. Mm -hmm. Like, you have to get them heavily wagging their tail, willing to jump for something. If you can identify that something, once you figure out what that something is that your dog visibly is getting excited, that they're moving their body rapidly for, okay, then you can use that thing and associate it to the front door. Now, it's going to be pretty frustrating in the beginning as you try to figure it out. So you're going to have to stay patient. Now, I'll tell you the way that I get dogs to bark. But the dogs that we're getting to bark are already predisposed to the thing that I'm going to use to get them to bark. So what we do with dogs that we want to bark, we put them in a harness or we put them in a wide two-inch collar. And then, of course, that collar is going to be attached to a leash and you know, they're going to be, you're going to be holding your dog. And then we use a toy called a flirt pole. And the flirt pole is a toy that's designed to tease, to flirt with your dog. And it's supposed to mimic, you know, it's kind of like this little uh, cloth that I have here. It's going to flop around and have all this fur come off. Look at that. It's going to have all this stuff coming off of it. Anyway, it's going to be flopping around. And as it flops around, your dog's going to be like, hey, how do I get that? And in that process, your dog is going to begin to bark, you know, because they're going to want to get to the toy. And when they get to the, and then when they do bark and you let go of the dog and they get to play with the toy, now you have a positive feedback mechanism to tell the dog to do this. So one way that you could do this is if you've taught the dog the game with the flirt pole, 
you have them in the harness, you show them the toy, and you tease them with the toy as you run out the front door, and you close the door. And then you start to knock and see if you can get the dog to bark. When the dog barks, you open the, do you open the door, and then you come and play with the toy. And as you do that, the dog is going to begin to understand the context of knocking, that that's going to produce the toy for the dog to be able to do that. Now, most dogs, I'd say like 90% of dogs, are going to bark at the slightest thing, but there is a subset of dogs that need to learn how to do this, and frustrating them and denying them the thing that they want so that way they get excited enough and they finally bark, and then rewarding them with it is the way to go. All right. Okay. How can I keep my Chihuahua from running away when I put it on the ground with no leash? Well, you got to be the most interesting thing in the environment because the dog is running away from you. What does that say about your relationship to the dog? That means that the dog is willing to run to everything else more than you. Now, I'm not trying to call you out if this is you, but, you know, your, your dog, why does it, why should the dog hang out with you? You know, what reason, what reason does the dog have? You know, I'm thinking about this over the weekend. Um, there's a, there's a Marvel movie that I really like. I really love watching Doctor Strange. Mm -hmm. And in the movie, uh, Doctor Strange is in the library, and he's with the librarian. And he looks over at the librarian after making some kind of funny comment, and he says, people used to laugh at my jokes. Or people, uh, yeah, people used to laugh at my jokes. And then the librarian says, did those people work for you? So, you know, and I thought it was kind of funny because the guy didn't, <laughs> the guy didn't, yeah, like, so Mandy's now laughing, right? But the thing is, is the guy didn't laugh and he was like, well, I guess that's the thing. You know, everybody was laughing at me because I was paying them to laugh. Well, your dog, your dog is going to hang around you because you pay them. Now, I'm not talking about money, but your chihuahua is going to hang around with you if the relationship is really worthwhile. Are you playing games with them? Are you actually hand feeding them? Are you also setting boundaries by using your leash? Or are you basically just lugging them around and maybe carrying them underneath your arm? Because if you're doing that, you're kind of like the dog's servant. You're not necessarily working in a relationship where there's kind of an exchange for, hey, you do this and I give you the stuff that you enjoy. So to get your dog to not bolt from you is a two-way street. You're going to have to build some habits by rewarding your dog for things that are actually useful, like moving with you. Staying where you ask, turning around and coming back. And the other thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to set some boundaries. And some of those boundaries are like, hey, you can't pull on the leash. Another one of those boundaries like, hey, if you, I tell you to stay and you don't, you can get in trouble. Another one of those boundaries is, hey, if I say your name and you decide to run away, that's not worth it. You, it's not worth the punishment that you could receive for doing that. Now... You may ask, how should I punish my dog? How should I reward my dog? And the, the, uh, my honest answer is, I don't know. You're going to have to discover who is my dog. What type of food do they like? What type of bedding do they like? Do they like you to pet them? Do they not like you to pet them? You know, do they, have a, do they need a, like a real narrow collar? Do they need a real wide collar? Do they need a harness? You have to start going about doing those things to kind of figure out your dog and to see, like, hey, is there... You know, who are you? And then as you become a student of your dog, uh, then you can form the relationship and then this problem that you have of your dog running away from you, it'll go away. It'll begin to go away because the dog will understand that, hey, you're worth staying with. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Okay, someone said, how do I stop my one-year-old Australian Shepherd from nipping at my face? Well, the first thing is, you know, and like, I don't know, like, what are you imagining when you see this, Mandy? A dog literally jump, like... But where are they? Like, what, like where are they in the I'm house? I'm imagining the on person the sitting down on the, the couch or the chair. That's exactly what I was thinking, you yeah. know. They're, they're, you're, you're probably lounging with your dog, Well, because right? they can't, I mean... For them to jump up while you're standing at like What kind of... Uh, so, well, so, okay, so there's different size Australian Shepherds. But yeah. if the dog is nipping your face and you're over five feet tall, um, you know, yeah, it looks, looks like we got a question mm -hmm. in there. Um, if your dog is jumping up at your face, if your dog is jumping up at your face and nipping at you, well, you know, that's an issue for sure, okay? 
Sorry, let me read that again. Yeah, so how do you how do you get them to stop at nipping? Well, like here's a really, really simple technique, okay? And I use this actually all, all the time, and I don't I don't get to show this in my content too much, but this is a technique that we use a lot. So a lot of dogs that we train with, um, I insist with my clients that their dog has to wear a leash inside the house if they have the expectation that they're gonna talk to the dog. And of course they're gonna talk to the dog, you know, you want to talk to your dog. So they have a leash on. So one of the things that I do is I have, I have these dogs wearing leashes. And when I see that they begin to get excited and maybe my hands are occupied with something else, I literally stand on the leash. And it prevents their upward mobility. Now, one thing that might be happening is you might be cuddling with the dog and you might say like, hey, I have a need to cuddle with this dog. But the dog says, I don't want to cuddle. I want to do wrestling. Mm -hmm. And... So you gotta, you gotta put those two things in line. If you have a really young dog, and I'd say if you have a dog that's less than a year old and you're on the couch and cuddling with your dog and your dog isn't staying particularly well where you want it to, then you've got some work to do. You've probably got a little bit ahead of yourself and you need to back up your training and show the dog that, hey, you have to stay on your place while I watch this 30 minute television show or I watch this YouTube video or I listen to Al's live stream, whatever it is, right? You know, putting that discipline into your dog, preventing a dog from doing anything is basically you, you frustrate them. You, you, give, you, you don't give them the ability to do the thing that they want to do, which is frustrating, or you make them uncomfortable. That means that you have to use some kind of training collar to set a boundary to say, like, I don't appreciate it when you do that. What a lot of people do is when they get frustrated, we use these things. And I don't think that you should use your hands to correct your dog. This is why I'm a big believer in using your tools to correct your dog. Use your leash, use your remote collar, use a pinch collar, use any one of these to be able to tell your dog that, okay, you're at a boundary. You're not supposed to be doing that thing. Yes, you need to reward the dog for doing the thing you actually want. But when it comes to preventing and stopping anything you don't want, you need to frustrate your dog and you need to make them uncomfortable. Not unnecessarily so but it needs to be enough that they're like, hey, that's not the right direction to move. So you gotta be thoughtful about it, but you also need to be firm enough that they completely get, they completely get it. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Yeah, so let's answer. Uh, so yeah. Eric, you asked, um, are Vienna sausages dangerous as treats? Well, not as a treat. I don't think, I don't think that it is. Um, actually, I remember as a kid eating these things that I thought that they were, oh, obviously Mandy does not like, do you not like Vienna sausages? Yeah, they're kind of a, yeah, I wouldn't say that in the I past decade. I probably ate them as a, a four-year-old maybe, um, but then somebody told me. Yeah, you know, it's elbow, elbows them. and, you know, other, <laughs> other, no other, other, no. other things. So, you know, look, yeah, so, so uh, Eric, to answer your question, you know, no, I don't think that they're dangerous as treats. Like, if your dog absolutely love, loves Vienna sausages and you're using that, to build some kind of behavior, then more power to you. What I would tell you though, is if this is the, if this is the main way that you're getting your dog to do things for you, then instead you're, you're actually training tricks instead of life habits and life skills. And it's my belief and it's been my experience that if you really wanna get a dog to learn how to do a skill, then yeah, it's cool to use the Vienna sausages and things of that ilk, but I don't, but I really recommend using their dog food to teach them that particular skill because that's going to build the skill way more rapidly because it's going to help the dog's brain with the proper nutrition that they need. Now, I'm not saying that a Vienna sausage is bad for the dog. As a matter of fact, you could probably, if you're a raw feeder, you could probably put that into a raw meal as a, as a component of a total picture. Now, if your dog is getting a massive amount of Vienna sausages, it probably looks like a Vienna sausage. So, you know, yeah, yeah like, you know, really, you need, you need to make sure, you need to make sure that your dog is getting complete nutrition rather than that. So, um, yeah, well, look, I, the, but the prong collar, like I see what you say, no, I use a prong collar to train obedience. Well, you know, the prong collar is a great tool for sure, right? But if you're training, if you're training obedience, why not consider... Why not consider showing your dog that it's really your voice um, and your gestures uh, that are teaching the dog? Now, I have nothing against prong collars. We use them all the time. And like maybe you, you just put one thing down, down that, hey, no, I use a prong collar train. Well, a prong collar is a good tool, right? 
You gotta be using other things along with the prong collar. You need to be using, you need to be timing your voice commands, making sure that your gestures are right. Heck, I even teach people leg commands. If you ever watch any of my videos, I use my left leg to tell a dog to heal and I use my right leg to teach a dog to stay. So you really wanna look at your training and see that it's, that it's comprehensive, that it's using pressure, that it's using scent, that it's using motion, and it's using sound, and in those orders to be able to help the dog to clearly comprehend what it is that you're asking them to do. So yeah, you know, Vienna sausages, they're great. I would probably use them. At one point in my career, I'll tell you this, when I first started training Jasmine, I was, I had cut up hot dogs in my mouth and to create a tension in the very beginning, I would point to my mouth, my dog would look up, and I would spit sauce, I would spit a hot dog to her. That's how I was trained to get attention. I haven't done that in probably six years because it's kind of gross, but uh, we're not doing that any longer. So, hey, Eric, thanks so much for the question, man. Really, really appreciate you. Uh, thank you very much. I might buy my dog. I bet dogs really love Vienna. No, they really do. Like, it's not, a, it. it's not, a, but like, um, so now that we're kind of talking about the Vienna sausage, one of the reasons that I don't use them, like, I like hot dogs. And I'll use hot dogs to train a dog because one thing I talk about is the transactability of a piece of food all the time. So like, you know, we've got these chips right here. So if like, if I was going to reward a dog with this, this is too big. What I would have to do with this chip right here is I would have yeah. to cut it up into little things. So I always tell people, like you can't go to the grocery store, you can't go to the grocery store and pay for anything with a gold brick. Yeah, the gold brick has massive amount of value, but the cashier's gonna look at you and be like, what the hell do you want me to do with that? Mm -hmm. So Retire. you, you gotta take you gotta take something that you can actually transact and exchange with the dog. And what I don't like about the Vienna sausages um, is that they're kind of soft and mushy. They don't necessarily hold together. I'm yeah. wearing a tree pouch That's and true. I'm jamming my hand in there. And if you think it, it, you know, by the end of the training session, I'm gonna have just a solid line of elbows and assholes at the bottom really that's what you're gonna see so i don't i i would much rather a piece of kibble or a treat or something like that but you need to be able to transact the thing that you that you want with a dog and that's why i love kibble because one cup of kibble has like 900 pieces of food yeah yeah and so like you're going to be able to transact a whole bunch right there yeah that is yeah okay somebody mm, I said how do i stop my dog from nipping yeah i don't think we should skip that one because yeah, we, kind we of, just answered that yeah we just yeah, kind of answered okay. that one um on average how long does it take to potty train a dog what's been your experience mandy because you've seen i think you might Look, have seen more I, dogs for, than, than i have i maybe. think i'm the master potty trainer you're the master potty trainer i mean i don't know it's usually pretty quick for me i mean so what do you think? A week, two weeks, a month, well, six six weeks, two years? If it's a puppy, um, I think realistically, um, like a four month old puppy. Yeah. You're yeah. done. Are you are you well done by then or? No, I'm thinking if you, if you get a puppy and you start potty training at eight weeks. Yeah, like at that young, I would, ex you know, I think it would take a month or two, like. So, so that puts you that puts you within the realm. Like, if you have an eight week old puppy, then they're probably potty trained four to five months. Of they age. should be, yeah. They should be, yeah. You know, I think I could say that. I think about Gabby, which is the last dog that I potty trained, and I think that she was probably ninety five percent by five months. She wasn't having any more accents. So, so we it's an older puppy, like. Yeah, like Fritz. When I got Fritz at four months. I never, we never had an accident with him. But Gabby was a little bit tougher, I think. Yeah. Gabby Definitely was a little bit, Gabby, and I, dog. you know, Gabby was a little bit tougher than some of the other dogs that I've worked with, but. So Rosie was trained to use puppy pads, but not really to go outside because, I don't know. And, and you know what I, I say, like if you're using a puppy pad, if you use a puppy pad, then you just take the puppy pad outside and then you begin to associate it to, because it has those pheromones that are supposed to be true, preyed on their true. right, so you could associate it that way. But it's way. like something about when you put them down on the grass, like... Well, there's scent there, right? Yeah, I mean, I do have dogs with scent, so that probably makes a difference. So, like, it's obvious, and, and I usually know, like, I watch them, and I time them, and I usually know when they have to go. So are, that, you creating the, are you creating them at all, or are you, are you watching them? 
both. You do but both? But I, you know, I'm home, so, you know, and I'm very observant, so I hear when they're drinking water, and I, I don't free feed, so. That's good. I, and I just. And this kind of goes back to, like, the potty training question that we had earlier, that, you know, if you are potty training, and you have a good sense for time, and that, like, hey, it's been maybe 15, 20 minutes yeah. since I did that, then take your dog out. I'm not saying that you absolutely always have to put your dog in a crate each and every time. But you got to have eyes like a hot. You have to really, really pay attention. And if you get distracted, if you get distracted once, it's not that big a deal. But if you get distracted nine times in a row, then you're going to have a problem with potty training. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But like you say, once they go in the grass and you praise them, they—they're—they just. That's really what. Yeah, I think um, so, man. Like you have to. Like it feels good to pee and poop. Yeah, like okay. It's supposed to, and then if, if then. This human comes in and comes and pets you and praises you and you know and giggles at you. Then you're gonna be like, "Wow, this is really fantastic! I should do mm -hmm. this again." Mm -hmm. If I do catch him, I mean, I do. I make this really annoying like buzzer sound, and it gets any dog to stop. Can you make before. that sound right now? Really <laughs> no, no, you can't no, if you want. It's kind of like that. Like the, the Dumb and Dumber. Annoying, yes, like, yes. like the Dumb and Dumber sound. Does it work? Do you think it works? Oh, it, oh, I know it works. Any, if a dog is doing something and I make that sound, it doesn't matter what they're doing. They stop what they're doing. They're like, oh, what are we doing that? <laughs> wow. So it works. I mean, that, yeah, you know, you can have aversive sound. Sound can be a form of punishment. Mm -hmm. But if they if they do that while they're that helps a lot too. Do you use that it. sound on humans as well? <laughs> Yeah. I've never heard it, so obviously I haven't done it. I have to think about it a minute. I to, no. Yeah, I know you have to think about <laughs> it. So. Gracie is probably like, Mom, you know you had, you've you used that on me before. Yeah, so. probably when they were toddlers, I did. Okay, do it. Okay. All right, so. <laughs> yeah. The, next, right? We're the, moving yeah, along? Yes, we're moving, we're moving along. Okay. Um, how, do I, how do I teach my dog a performance down you know and this is a good question i actually asked this question uh when i was at one of my clients homes um mm -hmm. using their their amazon echo and the, and the reason we I, the reason i asked that question is like somebody said like hey is there different types of downs and so yeah there are there are i never heard of that there, there actually are different types of downs if you guys ever watch any of the videos where i'm training with uh with gabby you're going to hear me sometimes say the word plots and that's spelled P-L-A-T-Z. It's a German word. And I think it technically translates into the word place. But we use it as the down, com as the down command. So the way that my dogs are trained, um, we have several commands. We can have like lay down. Uh, we can have like go to your bed, which has a down part to it. Mm -hmm. And we also have plots. So what I like to do with my dogs is when I'm training a performance command for sport, for AKC obedience, for IGP, Schutzhund, Mondial ring, French ring, rally, any of these things that I need, I need the dog to do the down to a written standard. The first thing that I do is I create the behavior exactly or higher than the written standard. So I gotta like, and I have to be real mindful here. I gotta make sure that the dogs that the dog's hips, that the dog's elbows, that like every part of the dog's carriage is absolutely correct. If you ever look at your dog when they're doing something, you might notice that their hips are rolled to the side, or maybe one elbow is kind of this way or that way. And in general, that stuff doesn't really matter. But when it comes to a performance down, okay, the judge, when they're looking at your dog, is looking for a specific picture. And if the dog hasn't achieved that picture, they're going to take points away from you. So the way that I teach it is first, I'm generally going to lure a dog. I'm going to take a bunch of food in my hand, uh, the stuff that they absolutely love. And then I'll use any technique that I can to get the dog into the exact position of that behavior that I want. And then I overwhelm that position with reinforcement. Okay, I'll try, I'll try a whole bunch of things to really get that position. And then I begin to drill. This is not necessarily something that you're going to train in like your everyday lifestyle, like you're cooking in the kitchen and you need the dog to lay down. No, this is like you're by a wall and you say, hey, we're going to get 94 repetitions of you going into the down properly. 
you know, so it's kind of like being at the gym, so to speak. So you begin to create this very exact position that you want from the dog and you heavily reinforce it. And then you work out and you make the dog do that position over and over. Once you get the dog doing that position the way that you want them to, then and only then would I add the voice command. Now very quickly with a lot of my clients, you guys that are watching, we'll add a voice command from the get. From the get-go, you know, we're saying go to your bed, we're saying down, we're saying free, we're saying let's go, we're saying come, you know, we're saying these commands to the dog. And that's good, and you should do that. When it comes to your performance commands, don't associate the command until the dog truly knows how to do the behavior that you want them to do. So then that way, when you do associate it, it actually creates the exact thing that you want. And don't be careless with it. Don't be careless with your performance commands. I see a lot of people that start with the dog's first command being a performance command and they don't give the dog a chance to learn, you know, like, you know, to be a little inconsistent but to still be close to being right. So that's how I go about teaching a performance command, but you got to drill and you got to really avoid associating the voice command until you get the behavior the way that you want it to be. Okay. Um... How, how do I get my dog not to spill water everywhere when they drink? Yeah, good. Like, so I'm glad, I'm, glad you asked, I'm glad you asked this, okay? I'm glad you brought that one up. You know, we use a lot of, we use a lot of different products. Uh, this is a product uh, that I use. Um, it is called the Buddy Bowl. It's actually made uh, by Ray Allen uh, Manufacturing or actually at least sold, uh, sold by them. Um, I really like these. I've been using them for a number of years, and I actually meant to make uh, make a YouTube video just kind of reviewing it, and it's, it's just kind of uh, fallen by the wayside a little bit. But I just want to show you all something really quick. Um, I brought, uh, I have a, a glass, I have a glass of water right here, so just want to show you what a Buddy Bowl does. I'm going to go ahead and pour that water into there. So when I pour it in there, it's going to go into this, ca it's going to go into this cavity, and so the water is in there, and so now, technically, when I spin this, when I spin this around, it shouldn't spill at all. So now I'm going to do that, and then the water that I poured in there comes out. And so now, I've, yeah, there's water in there. So when there, when you, what happens with your dog is your dog's going to put their mouth down in there, and they're only going to be able to get enough to continue to drink. And as it does that, it's going to continue to flood into the chamber that's in there for the dog to be able to get this. So they're not going to make a huge mess. Hmm. They're not, and I've been using these for probably five or six years. This is what actually some police departments are putting in the back of their cars. Mm -hmm. So as they're driving around, their dog has access to water because, as again, as you see, it's not going to spill any water, any water as you go about, you go about doing that. So like what, what, happens, what happens to the water that does that, it's going to get caught by the slip that's this slip that's right there. So here we've got the water in there. Now what I did find with this size is that when I filled it, and there's a line inside of here that says fill line, when I fill it to the fill line, it spills a little bit. A little bit. But if your whole kitchen and your whole home is just yes. sloshed with water, Way so different. a buddy bowl is really a nice way to go and to minimize and mitigate how much water uh, how much water is inside your your dog is spilling uh, all over the place. I don't think they're that expensive. You know, maybe maybe thirty dollars max, maybe twenty five, twenty dollars for one of these. I uh, this is the thirty two ounce one. I have the sixty four ounce one in there. One of the really cute things that Gabby does is that when it goes empty, she'll grab it and she'll bring it into my living room and drop it at my feet for me to come and fill it up again. <laughs> um, but it's great because there we go. Like, I think I got a drop to come out. Yeah, two drops right there. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm trying to get it now to, to, to spill water. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like it's doing a pretty good job, you know, with this cup. Right? What, what, what do you think that is? Is that a... It's eight, probably 8 ounce. Is it 8 ounce? Well, is that a 16 ounce maybe? Maybe like, a 12. Yeah, maybe a 12 ounce. So, yeah, like a little bit of water came out of there, but it's a far cry from what happens in a lot of homes. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so, the Buddy Bowl is a, yeah, the, 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 yeah, the Buddy Bowl is a pretty nice product to be able to use to mitigate how much water your dog is jump, uh, dumping. You can head over to rayallenk9.com, a really stand-up company. They make a lot of great things for, uh, for our law enforcement.
endorsement. Um, and this is one of the products that they do sell. And these come in a variety of colors, I think. And I, sizes? I, or yeah, or this is a 32 ounce. There's also a 64 ounce. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a purple. I have a black one. I think I also have a clear one uh, that at some point we're going to do a giveaway on these. And I'll be, I'll be giving away the purple one to oh. somebody here in the, in the near future. So. Yeah, I have to keep a towel under my water bowl. Yeah, like, well, I still keep a rubber. Like, I bought one of those rubber mats. Uh, not necessarily rubber mat, but it's like rubberized bottom. And it has mm -hmm. kind of like material over the top mm -hmm. underneath my buddy bowl in there. Because inevitably, when I'm pouring water in there, some of it's going to spill out because they're licking yeah. it they're drinking from me when I'm pouring it in there, but it's a pretty oh, yeah, good, yeah. it's a pretty good thing. I really like them. I've been using them for a number of years and I, I'd recommend them. Okay. Yeah, let's go maybe one or two, maybe one or two more questions. All right. And yeah, hey, just want to say thank you to everybody that's watching right now. We appreciate you guys uh, tuning in. Hey, if it's, if this is useful and you're watching right now, please, please, please hit the like button. Um, it really kind of helps us to promote uh, it really helps promote the dog training channel. Um, it helps us out. Um, if you would like uh, and you know somebody that would benefit from this, please uh, share this uh, video with them. Maybe even share the channel with them. But we really appreciate whenever you do that. If, if you didn't know, we're actually on a mission to try to get to a thousand subscribers. Um, that's actually kind of a big deal uh, to us. You know, when we get to a thousand, that, that does mean a couple of financial things for us. Uh, this channel would be at, uh, would be supported by advertisements. Um, and actually that's one of the ways that I help give back to my employees who really like, like Mandy, who does such a great job. This is a part of the way that I give back to them. Um, and then really, you know, to continue to, to create all this different content to, you know, to invest in the microphones and the cameras and the employees and all that stuff. So, heck, if, if you haven't subscribed, it would mean a lot to me personally if you would do that. If there's anything that I can do to help you, to maybe convince you to do that, I'm happy to do whatever it takes. But thanks to everybody. And yeah, Jade on the screen right now has all the ways that you can connect with us. You see, obviously, we have a Facebook page. You're here on our YouTube channel right now. Um, I also have I also have, uh, you can use your Amazon Echo um, if you just type in, uh, if you just say uh, to, your, uh, to your Alexa or to your Echo, uh, you know, open Al, Al's dog training tips. Uh, I was trying not to get her to hear me and she didn't hear me because you know, she's right across the room. Surprise. But if you say her name, if you say Alexa, if you say, uh, if you say that followed by enable Al's dog training tips, then you'll get daily dog training tips that we're making just for you guys. That's special just to your Amazon Echo. Uh, and I'm on Twitter as well. So if you wanna, if you wanna send me a question or you don't wanna uh, and connect with us on Twitter, we're there as well. So hey, appreciate each and every one of you guys. We'll go a couple more questions, but if anybody has questions, please feel free to drop those in the comment section below. Thank you guys so much. Okay, what's next? Okay. How do I know if my dog is overheating? Yeah, it's a good question, you know, and I really thought about this one and, you know, I, like, I don't know that I can give a clear cut answer about like, how do you know? Well, like your dog is probably panting pretty hard and, and breathing yeah. pretty heavily, right? Um, you know, that's one, that's, you know, that's, that's probably the one that I would see the most that, hey, there's very, very heavy respiration. Yeah. What do you think? Like, well, I know that, for instance, if you're walking your dog in dead summer, and if they, like, lay down in the middle of your walk, then they're, like, you need to carry them home. Yeah. Like, don't, try, and be conscious, because people don't, you know. Like, there's a really sad story, and this, this, is, a, uh, this is a former client of mine, and uh, he passed away, uh, you know, not to, not, uh, I'm not sure how long ago he passed away, but... He had uh, he was in a motorized chair and he had his dog with him. Uh, the first dog that I worked with, he had so he had his service dog with him, and the dog was pretty well conditioned. But the guy just he kept trucking, he kept trucking, towing the dog behind him, and the the dog went into heat stroke and did not survive. And uh, and man, it just like you know broke my heart, yeah. broke his heart. That's just a really terrible situation to be in. But you know. I don't know that I can give you clear cut things like your dog's respiration is, is, is probably the major one, but don't exert them in all this heat. You know, that we had a really good video this week or maybe last week where I was talking about the five second rule that if, if, you, can, if you can't put your hand down on the concrete for more than five seconds, 
um, then you can't go for a walk with your dog. And this is one great way to prevent heat exhaustion. Well, you know, several times this week I went out and we said, well, I want to see your walk, but we're not going to go for a walk. And we'd go out there, we'd put her hand down, and lo and behold, we couldn't go. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you guys right now, one time this week I actually did, I followed the five-second rule. We went out, put her hand down, five seconds, oh, it was good, we went, and then maybe ten minutes into the walk, the dog suddenly pulled over into the grass and laid down. And I was like, okay, what's going on? And I put my hand down in the concrete, and I could only make it to two. We picked the dog up, and we carried the dog all the way back. Some serious heat here in Texas. You know, it's, it's pretty serious, guys. So even if you follow the five-second rule, maybe you go five or six minutes, and then you, you check it again. Yeah. Because that concrete can get real hot real fast. You, one, you don't want to burn your pads up. But, hey, heaven forbid, man, don't kill your dog. Yeah, I know. We don't realize that. I mean, they're not... Just like, like and it's not like any one of us wants to do that. Like, nobody that's watching yeah. this, you know, or is a client of ours wants well, we to... we think if we're going to be, you know, if we're okay, our dog's okay, but that's not... But that's not the case, yeah. you know. Like, yeah, they've got a coat, and we don't. Um, and we have shoes. We have shoes, and yeah. they don't... They, they, probably the majority of the dogs that our clients have don't, you know, necessarily wear those boots that are going out there. So, you know, hey, you know, just be... Just be real conscientious, you know, walk early in the day, walk late in the day, check the concrete before you go out, make sure your dog's getting plenty of water throughout the day, and then watch the respiration, but be paying attention, you know, don't, like, like, don't pay attention too much to your phone or anything else that's going on. I don't want to throw the phone under the bus because I'm on my, I'm on my phone quite a bit all the time, um, but hey, you got to pay attention to your dog. Your you know, son. your dog cannot communicate to you the way that a human can. And so you really got to read their body language. Your eyes have to be on them. So that's, you know, that's what I recommend there. Yep. All right, what's the, what's the, what's the last question? Okay, let's go with, uh, how do I teach my dog to calm down when my mom gets home? It's really, you got to have a plan. And that's what I noticed with a lot of people is that they don't have a plan. The humans are not communicating like, you know, obviously yeah. you're, you, you've been at work all day and you're tired. You, you probably had to deal with our traffic. And so you're coming home, all this traffic. Maybe you don't have the greatest job, but whatever. You're, maybe, maybe you have a great job, but you're still tired. Yeah. And you walk in the door and then your dog jumps all over you. Mm -hmm. Well, you got to have a plan. If there's a human at home, then the first thing that human needs to do, maybe 10 minutes before you arrive home, which you can call them on your cell phone, is get them... Get them to put a leash on the dog and get them to begin to run a drill showing the dog that you're going to stay in a certain spot. And if you come off, then we're going to keep putting you back in that spot until you actually stay there. And then when you arrive, before you roll into the home, make sure that you've already communicated to the human that's on the inside to be ready to, you know, help your dog understand the differences of their choices. One mistake that people make is they don't allow the dog to make the mistake of breaking their place. Don't let the dog jump on the person. Do let your dog take one foot off of the, or break the stay by one step, mm -hmm. and then immediately put them back. And that's not so easy, but that's what you got to do. And then you might have to do that seven times in a row before you can actually reward your dog for actually becoming calmer. Look, your dog is excited because they love you, and I get that. So once the dog actually becomes calm in your presence, be sure to reward your dog, mm -hmm. but make the reward something that's in it for them, not a reward that just makes you feel good. Make sure that it's the right kind of reward for them. And I'm not talking about a piece of food or a game. I'm talking about the way that you deliver it to the dog so that way it helps them understand that you really value their calmness. You don't want to reward their calmness with your exuberance. Yeah. You want to reward their calmness with calmness of your own, but in a way that's meaningful to them. And it's going to have to take some thought to kind of figure out what that is for the dog. Mm -hmm. But that's what it takes to be able to teach your dog how to behave whenever your mom comes home from work. You know, that, yeah, I, it just, you're going to have to take some planning, a little bit of coordination, some practice for a couple of weeks, and... Dogs are smart. They'll, you know, I'm pretty sure they're going to figure it out. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I can add, don't tell your mom. I mean, nobody, when you get home, 
tell them to com- ignore the dog. Ignore like, the dog, man. We had to do that with Ranger, and now he sits. The rule has to be the dog has to be sitting and calm before you give any attention. And that's the thing. Like, it doesn't have to be that rule, but have a rule. Yeah. Have a rule that helps the dog understand that this is what we're expecting. Here's where the boundary Go is. Get it. Here's a, and they're smart, man. They've been like I, I've been saying this a lot. They've been with us for twenty thousand yeah. years. They know humans. Yeah. Probably maybe even they know better. how weak we are. <laughs> yeah, they do. They just yeah, show us their take cute. Advantage. Yeah, they're like it's funny because like a, a lot of times this week, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna make some of y'all maybe feel bad, but like some of y'all's dogs are really very cute. Really, we have some 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 of our clients' dogs have super cute dogs, and it's hard. Like you look at them and like, would I have to tell like a really cute dog like, hey, you're not allowed to do that? I don't really feel all that great about telling them like, hey, you can't act that way, but we do that to kind of benefit the dog. So like, I have empathy for you guys that have these really amazing looking, and all of them look amazing, but like some of them are you know better looking than others, right? So you see these really cute dogs yeah. and man, it just kind of melts mm-hmm. your heart and you're like, I just want to do whatever, whatever soft thing that I can do for you. But sometimes you got to tell them no. And, mm-hmm. you know, unfortunately, you know, that's mm-hmm. not always uh, the softest thing. Well, guys, thanks so much for watching. We really appreciate each and one of y'all. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. Tap that notification bell so that way you know the next time we're going live. Uh, we plan on going live probably a couple of weeks from now. Uh, I'm going to try to uh, not do dog training 1,000% of the time like I have been for the better part of this year. Uh, I'm going to try to do just a couple of different things. But hey, uh, so in love with you guys. Appreciate y'all. Uh, have a great night. Take care.